welcome. Selamat datang. And I do admire your stamina, your strength. <laughs> Now we're going to turn to the subject of integrity under pressure. And you'll see on the screen uh, that we're going to read now from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I think we'll read from verse 7 to verse 15. So you have a Bible with you, perhaps you turn to that and uh, may we'll read from verse 5. Tetapi harta ini kami punyai dalam bencana tanah lihat tanah liat supaya nyata bahwa kekuatan yang melimpah limpah itu berasal dari Allah bukan dari diri kami. Dalam segala hal kami ditindas namun tidak tersepit. Kami habis akal namun tidak putus asa. Kami dianiaya namun tidak ditinggalkan sendirian. Kami dihempaskan namun tidak binasa. Kami senantiasa membawa kematian Yesus di dalam tubuh kami, supaya kehidupan Yesus juga menjadi nyata di dalam tubuh kami. Sebab kami yang masih hidup ini terus menerus diserahkan kepada maut karena Yesus, supaya juga hidup Yesus menjadi nyata di dalam tubuh kami yang panah ini. Maka demikianlah maut kiat di dalam diri kami dan hidup kiat di dalam kamu. Namun karena kami memiliki roh iman yang sama, seperti ada tertulis, aku percaya sebab itu aku berkata-kata, maka kami juga percaya, dan sebab itu kami juga berkata-kata. Karena kami tahu bahwa ia yang telah membangkitkan Tuhan Yesus, akan membangkitkan kami juga bersama-sama dengan Yesus. Dan ia akan menghadapkan kami bersama-sama dengan kamu kepada dirinya. Sebab semuanya itu terjadi oleh karena kamu. Supaya kasih karunia yang semakin besar berhubung dengan semakin banyaknya orang yang menjadi percaya, menyebabkan semakin melipatnya ucapan syukur bagi kemuliaan Allah. Recently, I was asked to interview a young man for a Christian organization. It was an organization that was developing mission in my continent, in Europe. And this young man had recently finished his studies at university. Pemuda ini baru saja menyelesaikan studinya di sebuah universitas. And he was now wanting to be involved in Christian service in Europe. Dan sekarang dia ingin terlibat dalam pelayanan Kristen di Eropa. So I asked him several questions, of course, about what he would like to do. Saya menanyakan, tentu saja saya menanyakan beberapa pertanyaan kepadanya tentang apa yang ingin dia lakukan. And I said, what are the main reasons why you want to be involved in Christian service? Saya menanyakan apa alasan yang utama. And he said, well, there are two main reasons. First of all, I'd like to travel around Europe. And secondly, I'd like to be financially secure. So, of course, we had to talk a little about his motives for Christian service. It raises that question for me in talking with him. Why do we do what we do in our Christian service? For some people, it is like my friend. It's simply a question of self-fulfillment. Untuk beberapa orang juga teman beberapa teman saya itu hanyalah untuk kepuasan diri. Not many people go into Christian service to be financially secure. Memang tidak banyak orang masuk ke dalam pelayanan Kristen untuk mendapatkan jaminan. But this young man obviously felt he wanted to use his gifts. But his main reasons were to be fulfilled as a person. Now, by contrast, I met another person not long ago. Saya bertemu dengan orang lain juga tidak berapa lama. 
he came from the Baltic states. And he was giving a lecture in my city on Christian activity and life in those countries. I was, very, I was very keen to meet him. Because about uh, 35 years ago, I had a photo of this man in my room. I was a student. And an organization had sent us some photos of people who were in prison because of their Christian service. And this man was a pastor in what was then the Soviet Union. And because he had proclaimed the name of Jesus Christ, he was sent to a camp in Siberia. So the photos were a reminder to pray for Christians who are under pressure. And when I, when I met him recently, I was so pleased to see him. But he explained that he and his family still carried something of the pain of that experience. And he is, of course, just one example of many people who suffer because of their commitments to Jesus Christ. Uh, you know about this issue in Indonesia. It's estimated that there are some 200 million Bible-believing Christians around the world in 35 countries who are suffering direct persecution. And Christian service is always going to be costly. Christianity isn't romantic, it isn't soft. Christian service will always take its toll, will always have its impact on us. And here in 2 Corinthians, Paul is very realistic about the challenges of living a life of integrity under pressure. How can we live with integrity when we are facing opposition? How can we live with integrity in a culture which behaves differently from Christian values? How can we live with integrity when there are so many weaknesses in our own lives? Well, I wonder how you view this question of weakness. I think in my culture, the qualities that we look for in a Christian leader might be similar to the qualities we look for in a prime minister or a president. We expect leaders with strength. They are bold, they are aggressive, they are powerful people. 
They are people who are in control. And in Paul's day, in the first century, there were people who thought about leadership like that. They thought that image was very important. That eloquence or rhetoric was what really mattered for leaders. In fact, it was because Paul often failed to match up to this expectation that he was being criticized. But the significance about this letter to Corinthians is that Paul, Paul began to discover a very important paradox. It's a paradox at the heart of the Christian message. And it's a paradox at the heart of Christian service. And I put it on the screen. There it is. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now Paul faced all kinds of difficulties. In fact, in many parts of the letter, he gives a catalogue of the sufferings which he faced. He was pushed right to the limits of his endurance. His Christian service was quite literally killing him. And what Paul came to understand was that in carrying out God's work, human resources have their limits. And I'm sure that all of us in this room have often felt the same. You look at the size of the task that God has given you. You look at the opposition which you have to face. Maybe you have your own feelings of weakness or doubt. How is it possible to serve God in this kind of world? Well, it was this that then came as a breakthrough for Paul. He came to understand that it was right in the middle of this weakness that you discover God's power. And he saw his own pressures as a reflection of what was happening in the gospel message. What is the gospel? It is God at work in the weakness of the crucified Jesus. It's God's power seen through the apparent weakness of his son. So it is no surprise that the gospel will reach other people through the weakness of his service. And that's when Paul discovered the answer. When I am weak, then I am strong. 
Sebab jika aku lemah, maka aku kuat. When I am weak, I can experience God's grace and God's power. Ketika aku lemah, aku dapat mengalami kasih karunia Allah dan kuasanya. But when I was very young, my father gave me a simple illustration. Ketika saya masih muda, uh, ayah saya memberikan kepada saya sebuah ilustrasi. When he said that uh, Christians are like a tea bag. Seorang Kristen seperti sebuah kantong teh. That our real strength is only shown when we get into hot water. Kekuatan kita yang sesungguhnya hanya kelihatan atau hanya tampak ketika dicelupkan ke dalam it's air not, yang panas. It's not until we are under pressure that we begin to discover the strength and power that God is making available to us. Hanya ketika kita di dalam tekanan kita menemukan uh, kuasa Allah, kasih karunia Allah. So I want us to explore how we live under pressure by looking at these verses under three headings. How do we cope with these weaknesses? First of all, weakness is the occasion for God's power. Verses 7 to 9 of the section that we've read together. And he talks first of all about the message and the messenger, as you'll see on the screen. Verse 7, we have this treasure in jars of clay. Well, this is a very familiar picture which Paul uses. Ini merupakan satu gambaran yang uh, sudah biasa yang Paulus gunakan. Maybe he's thinking of a cheap pottery lamp. Mungkin dia memikirkan tentang pejana uh, tanah liat yang murah. It carries the light. The lamp holds the light. Oh, uh, Paulus mungkin memikirkan tentang satu lampu yang dari tanah liat and the more cracks there are in this pottery lamp the better it is it allows the light to shine out or maybe he's thinking uh, back to an illustration he uses in chapter 2 of an army that's just won a great victory and the treasure which they have won is kept in these large clay pots. Well, of course, clay pots are still used in the Middle East even now, despite plastic. Uh, they're used for all kinds of reasons. They're ordinary clay jars, they're very easily broken. And Paul's point in this illustration is very clear. He wants to emphasize the paradox. He underlines that there is a wonderful message, the power of the majesty of the message. But there is a weak and a fragile messenger. So it's a great treasure, a great light. It is a treasure or a light. Uh, but it's held in this very weak container. That's how Paul felt about himself. And the reason for this is expressed in verse 7. To show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. 
supaya tahu bahwa kekuatan yang melipat-lipat itu berasal dari Allah, bukan dari diri kami. Now you take Paul as an example. Saya mengambil contoh Paulus. As far as we can tell, he didn't look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Dia tidak tampak seperti seorang bintang film Arnold Schwarzenegger. He probably didn't have a very big physical frame. Dia mungkin tidak mempunyai tubuh yang besar dan kuat. He probably had some eye problems. Ya mungkin memiliki masalah dengan melihatannya, dengan matanya. The Christian said he couldn't speak very well. Orang-orang Korintus mengatakan bahwa ia tidak bisa berbicara dengan baik. Good, says Paul. Baik, kata Paulus. Because if people become Christians, karena jika orang-orang menjadi Kristen, it will be because of the power of the gospel, not because of me. Itu karena kuasa Injil, bukan karena aku. That your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men, but the power of God, he says in 1 Corinthians. Jadi di satu Korintus dia mengatakan bahwa imanmu tidak boleh didasarkan pada kekuatan diri sendiri, tetapi pada kuasa kekuatan Allah. He said the same in 1 Corinthians about the gospel itself. Dia mengatakan hal yang sama dalam satu Korintus tentang Injil. The foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. Bahwa ketolongan dunia adalah kebijakan adalah. The foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. Kebodohan apa yang tampak bagi dunia suatu kebodohan adalah adalah kebijaksanaan bagi Allah adalah hikmat bagi Allah. And the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Kelemahan Allah manusia adalah kekuatan Allah. So he's talking about the paradox of the gospel. Jadi dia sedang mengatakan tentang kontradiksi atau paradoks dari Injil. And he said, well, look at the Corinthian congregation. Look at the church. Lihatlah. Semangat Korintus, lihatlah gereja di Korintus. Did God choose lots of rich and powerful, wealthy people? Apakah Allah menggunakan orang-orang yang kaya dan yang memiliki kuasa? Not many. Tidak banyak orang yang seperti itu. Most of you are very ordinary people. Sebagian dari kamu, sebagian besar dari kalian adalah orang-orang yang biasa. So you see what Paul is demonstrating here. Jadi ada melihat apa yang Paulus katakan di sini. God is at work through the weakness of Jesus on the cross. Tuhan bekerja melalui kelemahan Kristus di salib. God can be seen in this very lowly congregation in Corinth. Allah dapat dilihat dari lemah dari semangat yang lemah di Korintus. And God is at work through the weakness of messengers like us. Allah sedang bekerja. God is at work through the weakness of messengers like us. Allah sedang bekerja melalui kelemahan dari sang pengabar berita atau si pembawa pesan seperti kita. So to make his point, he gives a series of illustrations in verses eight and nine. Yang memberikan ilustrasi dalam ayat yang ke delapan belas. On the screen, I called it the paradox of Christian service. Di layar CD saya menuliskan paradoks dari pelayanan Kristen. And it's a very clever piece of writing. Ini merupakan satu permainan kata-kata yang permainan kalimat yang baik. There are lots of plays on words in the way in which he writes. Paulus menggunakan banyak permainan kata-kata. I put one paraphrase on the screen. I don't know if it works in Indonesian. Saya tidak tahu apakah kita bisa melihat permainan kata-katanya dalam bahasa Indonesia. He says they can knock me down, but they cannot knock me out. Ia berkata mereka dapat mengumpul kuzaku. Tetapi tidak pernah dapat membuatku terkelengkap. What Paul is explaining is what many Christians experience. Maybe you've experienced this too. Apa yang Paulus katakan adalah yang dialami oleh banyak orang Kristen yang mungkin juga dialami oleh anda. That you are stretched to the limits in your service for God. Bahwa anda telah bertekan sampai pada batas anda dalam pelayanan kepada Tuhan. You feel the exhaustion. Anda merasa sangat lelah. Maybe you feel disappointed or discouraged. Mungkin anda merasa kecewa dan tawar hati. Like anybody who gives themselves to Christian service will feel like this. 
Tetapi setiap orang yang memberikan diri pada pelayanan Kristen akan merasa seperti itu. But the experience of God's people is just as Paul describes it. Tetapi uh, apa yang dialami oleh anak-anak Tuhan sama seperti yang dikatakan Paulus. That the end of our resources is not the end of God's resources. Bahwa oh, jika uh, sumber-sumber diri kita sudah habis, sumber-sumber Allah itu tidak habis. But these moments of pressure can be moments when we prove God's grace and power. Masa-masa penuh tekanan seperti ini adalah situasi di mana Allah bisa mendemonstrasikan kuasa. I love the uh, phrase which is quoted of a, of a Dutch Christian. Oh, saya menyukai satu kalimat dari seorang Kristen yang berwarnan seorang warga negara, seorang Kristen yang kebangsaan Belanda. Her name is Betsy Ten Boom. Namanya adalah Betsy Ten Boom. And she was in a German concentration camp in the Second World War. Dia berada dalam satu kamp konsentrasi di Perang Dunia Kedua. And when she was in Regensburg concentration camp. Ketika dia berada dalam This is what she said. There is no pit so deep that God is not deeper still. But however extreme our situation might be, God is always there in His strength. Weakness is the occasion for God's power. That we can live with integrity under pressure. Because it is in those moments that God's grace and power can be seen. Secondly, weakness is the consequence of being united to Jesus Christ. Yang kedua, kelemahan merupakan konsekuensi menjadi satu dengan Kristus. And now, in verses 10 to 12, Paul demonstrates this connection. Di ayat 10 sampai 12, Paulus memperlihatkan kaitan ini. You'll see on the screen, first of all, the connection between weakness and the dying of Jesus. Di layar sini anda bisa melihat. So Paul thinks about the challenges and the pressures which he is facing. And he realizes, well, that's just what Jesus had to face. So on the screen you'll see verse 10 that he says he carries in his body the death of Jesus. Or verse 11, we are given over to death for Jesus' sake. So it's simple, he says. I am simply copying Jesus. I am sharing my master's earthly experience. Four times he uses the word Jesus. The man, Jesus. So, because he is identified with Jesus, he will suffer just as Jesus suffered. In fact, in verse 10, it's not just, I carry the death of Jesus. He uses the word for the dying of Jesus. Dia menggunakan kata kematian Yesus. It's the process of dying. Itu adalah proses kematian. He says, I am carrying around this process of dying, the dying of Jesus. Kami senantiasa membawa proses kematian 
So when you look at the catalogue of sufferings which he gives us in 2 Corinthians 11, Jadi kalau kita melihat katalog penderitaan atau daftar penderitaan Paulus dalam uh, 2 Korintus 11, he probably looked like somebody who was in the process of dying. Ya nampak seperti seseorang yang sedang dalam proses untuk mati. He looked at times as if he was being crucified. Ya tampak seperti dia sedang disalibkan. So if you are a committed Christian, jika anda seorang Kristen yang berkomitmen, then you are united to Jesus Christ. Jika anda dipersatukan dengan Kristus, that's the best definition of a Christian, I think. Itu adalah satu definisi yang paling baik dari kekristenan. A Christian is a person united to Jesus Christ. Seorang Kristen adalah seorang yang dipersatukan dengan Kristus. And therefore, there is no avoiding this kind of pressure or weakness. Itu sebabnya tidak pernah ada uh, satu penghindaran dari penderitaan ini. And if we as Christians are just looking for success or for worldly power, sehingga sebagai orang Kristen kita hanya melihat, kita hanya mencari kesuksesan dan kuasa dunia, then we are not followers of the crucified Jesus. Berarti kita bukanlah pengikut dari Yesus yang disalibkan itu. But then Paul also says another thing about this unity with Jesus. Kemudian Paulus juga mengatakan hal yang lain mengenai kesatuan dengan Kristus ini. Because it also speaks about the power of the new life of Jesus. Karena dia juga berbicara mengenai kuasa dari hidup. If we are united, if we are united with Jesus' death, we are also united, we are bound up with his resurrection. Jika kita dipersatukan dengan kematian Yesus, kita juga dipersatukan dengan kebangkitan Kristus. So again, you'll see the references on the screen. Oh, anda bisa melihat um, rujukan ayat, ayat di LCD. Verse 11, we're given over to death so that his life may be revealed in our body. Ayat 11, supaya kehidupan Yesus juga menjadi nyata di dalam tubuh kami. And verse 14, the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus. Ayat 14, akan membangkitkan kami juga bersama-sama dengan Yesus. Now for us Christians, the resurrection is not just in the future. Bagi kita orang Kristen, kebangkitan Yesus bukan hanya terjadi di waktu yang akan datang. It really should be part of our experience now. Seharusnya itu menjadi bagian dari pengalaman kita hari sekarang. The life of Jesus being made known even in our bodies. Hidup Kristus uh, seharusnya bisa terlihat bahkan dalam tubuh kita. So I put the verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 4 on the screen. So, uh, jadi saya menuliskan pasal 13 ayat 4. He says, by God's power we will live with him to serve you. Tapi kami akan hidup bersama-sama dengan dia untuk melayani. Well, these two ideas are right at the heart of how we are to live when we are under pressure. Jadi poin ini merupakan poin bagaimana kita harus hidup di bawah tekanan. We are united to Jesus in his death. Kita dipersatukan dengan Kristus dalam kematiannya. We are united to Jesus in his life. Kita dipersatukan dengan Kristus dalam kebangkitannya. So there is no avoiding the pressures and the weaknesses that we experience. Jadi kita tidak bisa menghindari tekanan dan kesulitan-kesulitan dalam hidup kita. But those pressures are the opportunity to experience God's power and God's grace. Tapi tekanan-tekanan itu merupakan saat atau kondisi di mana kuasa Allah dinyatakan. And let me give you an illustration which I hope you will understand. Saya akan memberikan satu ilustrasi yang mungkin bisa menolong Anda untuk mengerti. It comes from my very first experience of sailing. Uh, ilustrasi ini diambil dari pengalaman pertama saya dalam berlayar. Um, you know, a, a sailboat, there is no motor, it simply depends on the power of the wind. Uh, sebuah kapal, Anda tahu sebuah kapal layar yang tidak memiliki motor, yang hanya bergantung kepada angin. And my first opportunity to sail a boat was uh, around an island in Scotland. Pengalaman pertama saya berlayar adalah mengelilingi sebuah pulau di Skotlandia. And unfortunately, the day we arrived, the wind rose very high and the rain started to pour down. Ketika saya 
saya datang uh, angin bertiup sangat besar. And because the wind was blowing so strongly, the boat was pushed over like that. Dia angin bertiup sangat kencang dan uh, kapalnya menjadi miring. Maybe you've seen sailing boats when they're pushed right over in the wind. Uh, anda mungkin pernah melihat uh, sebuah kapal yang di, uh, di, diarahkan oleh angin. In fact, um, for me, it was a real advantage that I have one leg that is shorter than the other. Bagi saya merupakan keuntungan untuk memiliki satu kaki yang lebih pendek dari yang lain. Because uh, everyone else was falling over and I could stand straight on the boat. Karena orang-orang lain uh, terjatuh. Tapi saya bisa berdiri tegak. And I learned something very significant about sailing. Saya mempelajari sesuatu yang penting mengenai berlayar. You can use these winds to make progress forward. Anda bisa menggunakan mengambil keuntungan dari angin ini untuk maju ke depan. If you ever sailed, you'll know you can go like this. It's a kind of zigzag movement like this. Ya, jika anda pernah berlayar, uh, anda tahu bahwa anda bisa uh, bergerak siksa. So the winds are against you. Jadi angin uh, berlawanan dengan anda. So you sail in this direction. Anda berlayar ke arah ini. Then you turn and you sail in this direction. Anda berbalik dan uh, ke arah sebaliknya. You turn again, you sail in this direction. Berbalik lagi. So it's very slow progress forward. But you are using the winds which are against you to make progress to your destination. Now this is the realistic teaching of 2 Corinthians. You cannot avoid the winds of our world. When you become a Christian, God doesn't beam you up into heaven. But he can take the winds which are against you. And he can use those to help you make progress forward. It is in the midst of this weakness that Paul discovered God's power. And it is for this reason that this letter of 2 Corinthians has really saved my life. The times when I would want to give up under pressure. Ada saat-saat di mana saya ingin menyerah di bawah tekanan. Or when I find it difficult to live with integrity when I'm facing the opposition. Ada saat-saat di mana sangat sulit bagi saya untuk hidup berintegritas ketika menghadapi lawan. I can hold on to this truth. God's power is made perfect in weakness. Saya dapat berpegang teguh pada kebenaran ini bahwa kuasa Allah nyata dalam kelemahan. That God gives me the resources by His grace. God provides the resources by His grace. My grace is sufficient for you, God said to Paul. And that grace allows me to live with integrity under pressure. Now I come to the third and the final theme. We've seen that weakness is the time when God's power can be seen. That weakness is the consequence of being united to Jesus Christ. But thirdly, weakness is productive. 
Republic. And Paul again is showing some paradox in the way he writes in these verses 13 to 15. Paulus sekali lagi menunjukkan satu kontradiksi dalam surat yang dia tulis di ayat 13. He says facing these difficulties produces a number of good results. Dia mengatakan bahwa kesulitan-kesulitan ini menghasilkan mengakibatkan hal-hal yang baik. First of all, as you see on the screen, it produces dependence and produces faith. Paul says, on the basis of my trust in Jesus, I will continue preaching the gospel. Even if it is very costly for me, I'm not going to keep quiet. And uh, in verse 13, he's actually quoting from a psalm. I believe, therefore I have spoken. Um, if you read that psalm, it's Psalm 116. Uh, jika anda membaca Mazmur, then, 119, you discover in that psalm that the writer had a very near-death experience. Anda menemukan bahwa penulis Mazmur sedang dalam sedang hampir mati. And it had a great impact on him. Dan situasi itu uh, memberikan akibat yang sangat besar kepadanya. And so Paul said, well, it was rather the same for me facing my pressures. Sama seperti Paul, sama seperti itu, saya juga mengalami penderitaan. God delivered the psalmist, and God will deliver me. Tuhan telah menyelamatkan pemasmur, dan Tuhan akan menolong menyelamatkan saya. So he says, I am not going to give up. Itu sebabnya saya tidak akan putus asa. We are not going to lose our integrity. Kita tidak akan we're going to continue in the same spirit as that songwriter in the Old Testament. I believe, and so I will keep speaking. So, 2 Corinthians tells us how this works in our lives. That the pressures which we all face in our Christian service forces us to trust God more than we otherwise would. He says the same in chapter 1. That the challenges that he faces happened so that he would not rely on himself, but would rely on God. And verses on the screen, chapter 1, verse 9. I think this has really been my own testimony. I mentioned to, to the faculty here yesterday my own experience. And you'll notice I use a walking stick. And this was because when I was five years old, I contracted polio. And it affected both of my legs. And both my arms. And uh, my children think it also affected my head. Well, I recovered in most places apart from my right leg. It's a very small problem, it's nothing really. But as a young Christian, it was very important for me to realize what Paul is saying in these verses. That one of the productive results of weakness is that it forces us to depend on God. 
bahwa salah satu akibat yang penting dari kelemahan hal yang produktif dari kelemahan adalah bahwa itu menghasilkan ketergantungan kepada Allah. This happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Itu terjadi supaya kita tidak bergantung kepada diri kita sendiri, tapi hanya kepada Allah untuk bangkitkan orang mati. So if there are pressures which you feel in your own Christian life, jadi jika ada tekanan-tekanan yang anda rasakan dalam hidup Kristen anda, which seem to you to make it impossible to live with integrity when you are under pressure, yang membuat anda merasa sangat tidak mungkin untuk hidup berintegritas, then it's worth remembering that this weakness provokes stronger faith in God. Sangat penting untuk mengingat bahwa kelemahan itu menghasilkan ketergantungan pada Allah. It strengthens our faith. It builds adult godliness. Ini menguatkan iman kita, membangun iman kita. Then the second result is this. Yang kedua adalah ini. It benefits others. Ini menguatkan orang lain. The weaknesses which I experience can be of benefit to other people. You'll see I put uh, verse 12 on the screen there. Where Paul says, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Or he says in verse 15, all of this, all of these difficulties, all of these pressures are for your benefit. So his experience of dying actually served to help the Corinthian Christians. Now that is an uncomfortable experience for us too, I know. Saya mengerti bahwa hal seperti ini bukanlah pengalaman yang menyenangkan. That if we're trying to share the good news with other people, jika kita uh, mencoba untuk berbagi kabar baik dengan orang lain, it can be a costly experience. Itu bisa menjadi pengalaman yang sangat mahal nantinya. This is a challenge for some Christian leaders. Ini merupakan suatu tantangan bagi para pemimpin Kristen. And they expect to be served, not to serve. Mereka mengharapkan untuk dilayani, bukan untuk melayani. But Paul makes it clear in these verses that the challenges he experiences are for the benefit of other believers. Tapi di sini Paulus dengan jelas mengatakan bahwa apa yang kami alami adalah untuk demi kepentingan kamu. Again, I put on the screen chapter one verse six. Saya menuliskan juga pasal satu ayat enam. He says, if if I am distressed, if I go through these difficulties, it is for your comfort and salvation. Jika kami menderita, hal itu untuk penghiburan dan keselamatan kamu. What I have gone through has brought the gospel to you. Apa yang setelah saya alami telah membawa injil kepada kamu. So very often these pressures and weaknesses in our lives will be to the eternal benefit of other people. Jadi sering kali apa yang kita alami membawa membawa pesan yang kekal kepada orang lain. And that leads to the third and the final benefit. Kemudian kita sampai pada keutuhan yang terakhir. That weakness results in God's glory. Bahwa kelemahan itu mengakibatkan membawa kemuliaan bagi Allah. That's how he expresses it in verse 15. Itu dinyatakan dalam ayat yang kelima. All this is for your benefit, as we just said. Ini semua demi kepentingan kamu. So that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. That's his third conclusion. That through all of these difficulties, jadi melalui semua penderitaan ini, it produces the one thing which really matters, God's glory. Ini menghasilkan satu hal yang sangat penting, yang paling penting adalah kemuliaan bagi Allah. Being a servant of the Lord Jesus as we are, sebagai pelayan Kristus seperti kita, can be a really tough job. Bisa merupakan satu hal yang sangat berat. It can take everything that we have. 
Dia bisa mengambil dari kita semua yang kita miliki. But we're not doing it for our personal benefits. Tapi kita tidak melakukannya untuk keuntungan diri sendiri. We're doing it for the glory of God who has called us into this service. Kita melakukannya untuk kemuliaan Allah yang sudah memanggil kita ke dalam pelayanan ini. So on the screen you can see this lovely ripple effect, this chain reaction. Jadi di layar LCD kita bisa melihat akibat yang sangat besar. The gospel reaches more and more people. Injil terjangkau lebih dan lebih banyak orang. And that results in more and more thanksgiving. Berakibat pada makin melimpahnya ucapan syukur. And that thanksgiving overflows into a declaration of God's glory. Ucapan syukur yang limpah itu membawa pada pengakuan yang lebih besar akan kemuliaan Allah. Well, we can put up with a great deal if we know what the end results will be. Kita bisa bertahan jika kita tahu bagaimana akhirnya. We can live with integrity under pressure. Kita bisa hidup dengan kita bisa hidup berintegritas di bawah tekanan. Because we know that then God's grace will impact more and more people. Karena kita tahu bahwa kasih karunia Allah akan menjangkau lebih banyak orang. God's victories will be seen. Kemenangan Allah akan terlihat. And God's glory will be the result of everything which we go through. Well, I finish with a closing illustration. A short while ago, I was in Australia and I met the daughter of a person I had prayed for. She's the daughter of a couple called Graham and Gladys Staines. Graham was a missionary from Australia who was working in the north of India. And a few years ago, he was with his two sons in his car in North India. And a group of people came and set the car alight. They set it on fire. And he and his two sons were brutally killed in that fire. Well, he was working with very poor people, with lepers, in that part of Orissa. And many people were very angry that this man and his sons had been killed. And his wife was interviewed on the uh, television and in newspapers. And she was a great example of living with integrity under pressure. Dia merupakan satu contoh yang sangat baik bagi seorang yang hidup dengan integritas di bawah tekanan. Because the day after this murder, she said to the newspapers. Karena sehari setelah pembunuhan itu, dia berkata kepada wartawan. I am deeply upset, but I am not angry. Saya sangat sedih, tetapi saya tidak marah. For Jesus has taught us how to love our enemies. And she chose to stay and carry on with her husband's work. And her words were carried in newspapers not only across India but in other parts of the world. And hundreds of Hindus came to churches to say, "What makes you Christians different?" Dan begitu banyak orang Hindu datang untuk datang dan bertanya, bagaimana orang Kristen bisa begitu berbeda? Many of them asked for Bibles to read. Banyak dari mereka yang minta dibacakan Alkitab. 
And uh, one of my friends who visited here in Indonesia, his name is Vinod Ramachandra. As he looked at the impact of that weak woman, he said that a middle-aged Australian widow had done more for the cause of the gospel than all of the 24-hour radio evangelists. The power of the gospel is seen in the weakness of the crucified Jesus. And the power of the gospel is going to be seen in the weakness of us, his followers. We can live with integrity under pressure because God promises His grace and power. And so as, we, as Paul says in verse 16, Therefore we do not lose heart. We don't give up. Let me finish by asking us to read this aloud on the screen. This sums up what Paul says about living with integrity under pressure. So let's read it together. Jadi mari kita membaca bersama-sama. Tetapi jawab Tuhan kepadaku, cukuplah kasih karuniamu bagimu, sebab justru dalam kelemahanlah kuasaku menjadi sempurna. Sebab itu terlebih suka aku berpegang atas kelemahanku supaya kuasa Kristus turun menaungi aku. Karena itu aku senang dan rela di dalam kelemahan, di dalam penganiayaan dan kesesakan oleh karena Kristus. Sebab jika aku lemah What about other kinds of witness, such as sex temptation around us? How can it demonstrate the power of God while it is very risky to our life Christianity? In fact, witness from sex temptation is not in the story of Jesus or Paul's life in the Bible, but it stays around us. Nah, mungkin kita perlu klarifikasi ya, uh, witness yang dimaksudkan Pak uh, Jonathan Lem itu tidak sama dengan temptation atau uh, kecenderungan berdosa, ya. Jadi, tapi ini memang perubahan yang juga dihadapi tentang integritas dalam hal uh, seksual. Now, this is a very important question in our society, of course. And it is true that in 2 Corinthians, Paul does not discuss this. Issue. Except we know that in his discussion with the Corinthians, one of the issues he was tackling was the moral problem in Corinth. The situation in Corinth in the first century was very similar to, uh, to modern society. 
situasi jemaat Korintus di abad yang pertama sangat mirip dengan uh, saat ini. There was a great deal of idolatry. Ada begitu banyak pemujaan berhala. Uh, there was a lot of loose living sexually. Ada begitu banyak kehidupan bebas, uh, kehidupan seks yang bebas. And Paul realized that the influence of first century Corinth was impacting the Christian community. Paulus juga menyadari bahwa kehidupan yang seperti itu dalam di Korintus juga berakibat pada jemaat di Korintus. And so that's why he addresses the challenge in first Corinthians. Itu sebabnya dia uh, menuliskan tantangan-tantangan. Recognizing that our bodies belong to God. Dia mengatakan bahwa kita harus menyadari bahwa tubuh kita milik Allah. We must live according to God's standards. Bahwa kita harus hidup seturut dengan standar Allah. Now, of course, the Christian framework for understanding our humanity and our sexuality. Kerangka pikir Kristen kita tentang seksualitas dan is built around our Christian worldview, our understanding of the. Jadi kerangka pikir kita harus dibangun atas kerangka pikir Alkitab. That is our belief in creation. God is the good creator. Kalau kita percaya akan ciptaan Allah yang baik. And God is the good creator of sexuality. Kalau Allah juga merupakan pencipta dari seksualitas, seksualitas itu baik. Therefore, of one man and one woman in marriage. Itu sebabnya hanya ada satu wanita dan pria dalam satu pernikahan. And because of our belief in that, Christians must say that sex is good. Karena kepercayaan kita, apa orang Kristen harus mengatakan bahwa seks itu baik. Within that framework that God has designed, it is perfect. Bahwa dengan kerangka Berpikir yang sudah diberikan Allah. And that we are tempted to live outside of the boundaries which God has given us. Kita dicobai untuk hidup di luar batasan-batasan yang sudah diciptakan Allah. In many societies, people think that that is real freedom to do what we want. Dalam beberapa komunitas, orang mengatakan. But it's actually the opposite of freedom. Tapi itu adalah hal yang berlawanan dengan kemerdekaan. At home, we have had a small fish in a bowl. Di rumah saya memiliki seekor ikan kecil di sebuah akuarium kecil. His name is Julia. Namanya adalah Julia. And he has a very small bowl in which he lives. Dia tinggal di sebuah mangkok yang kecil. Now, if he wanted to have freedom, he could jump out of the bowl. Kalau dia mau lebih bebas, dia bisa saja melompat keluar dari si itu dari mangkok. I'm afraid he would land on the floor in our kitchen. Tapi saya khawatir dia akan mendarat di lantai dapur. And he would not enjoy greater freedom. Dia tidak akan menyukai kebebasan seperti itu. I'm afraid he would go where all good fish go. I'm not sure where that is. Saya rasa dia akan pergi ke tempat di mana semua ikan pergi kalau mati. If he were to jump out of the bowl, tapi jika dia tidak melompat keluar, and into a river or into a lake, tapi kalau dia melompat keluar lalu jatuh di sungai atau laut, then he would enjoy greater freedom. Dia akan menyukai kebebasan itu. Because he is living in the environment for which he was made. Karena dia hidup di satu lingkungan di mana dia semestinya hidup. And this is what the Bible teaches us about sex. Dan inilah yang diajarkan Alkitab mengenai seksualitas. That true freedom is to live within the guidelines that God has given us. So sesungguhnya. Kita harus hidup di dalam batasan-batasan yang sudah diberikan oleh Allah. To live according to these parameters that He has provided. Untuk hidup seturut dengan aturan-aturan, parameter yang sudah diciptakan Allah. So that's why it's possible for us to live a truly free life, to live as God wants us to live. Itu sebabnya 
adalah mungkin bagi kita untuk hidup seturut dengan bagaimana Tuhan ingin kita hidup. And to live any other way is not freedom; it is actually bondage. Kalau kita hidup dengan cara yang lain, sebetulnya itu bukanlah satu kebebasan. Itu sesungguhnya adalah satu perhambaan. And you discover that people who are free sexually very often deeply regret this. Kita tahu bahwa orang yang telah hidup bebas secara seksual seringkali menyesalinya. So we come to the third idea of the Christian worldview. Kita tiba pada at creation. Poin ketiga. The fall. And then redemption through Jesus Christ. So for those who are in Jesus Christ, we are made new, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5. And by the Holy Spirit, we are empowered to live as we should live in all areas of and this in truth includes the freedom to live sexually as God intended us to live. So I understand the importance of this question. It is a real pressure for many people in our society. Christians. Christians too. And therefore, we need to live with integrity, just as in all other areas. So that our lives match God's purposes and values. So to do this, we will need the help of other Christians. And if you feel this temptation strongly, you feel this weakness that Paul is describing it. Then it's precisely the time that we need God's power and God's grace, as he says. And God will provide for us. Terima kasih atas waktunya. Saya mau bertanya kepada Pak Jaya. Nama saya Agus dari Sidoarjo. Kalau kita bicara komunitas, enak dikatakan aku sudah tidak benar. Kenapa saya mengatakan demikian? Karena kalau kita bicara komunitas, kita bicara suara hati. Di mana kalau suara hati kita itu tidak bisa dibohongi. Kalau suara hati itu kita bicara, itu harus sama dengan pikiran, perkataan, dan perbuatan kita. Di tengah-tengah kehidupan saat ini, memang sulit integritas itu dapat kita berinteraksikan di dalam kehidupan kita. Yang ingin saya tanyakan, bagaimana atau prinsip-prinsip apa agar integritas ini dapat dilakukan dengan konsisten bagi orang-orang Kristen. Terima kasih. Uh, thank you for the question. I think I understand what you are um, seeking to ask. Terima kasih untuk pertanyaannya. Saya rasa saya mengerti apa yang dikatakan. How is it possible to live with consistency between what we believe and how we act and our character? Is that right? Bagaimana? Apakah benar kalau yang ditanyakan itu bagaimana kita hidup secara konsisten dengan apa yang kita katakan, apa yang sikap yang kita lakukan? And here I want to come back to the illustration I gave a moment ago about the fish. Saya ingin kembali pada ilustrasi yang saya berikan tadi tentang seekor ikan. The question of freedom. Dan pertanyaan tentang kebebasan. How did Jesus say we will be free? Bagaimana Tuhan Yesus mengatakan bahwa kita dapat bebas? Do you remember what he said? Adakah anda ingat apa yang Tuhan Yesus katakan? He said it is the truth 
which sets you free. Dia mengatakan bahwa kebenaran akan memerdekakan engkau. It is living by the truth that he brings that we are able to live in a consistent manner. Dia mengatakan bahwa jika jika kita hidup jika kita hidup dengan benar maka itu akan menolong kita untuk hidup konsisten. And so he says in his prayer in John 17. Jadi dia mengatakan Tuhan Yesus mengatakan dalam doanya di Yohanes 17. He asks God to sanctify them by the truth. Dia meminta Allah untuk memuduskan mereka oleh benar. That is to make us holy, complete, in live with integrity by the truth. Jadi untuk membuat kita hidup berintegritas secara utuh oleh kebenaran. So my very short answer to a very demanding question is that we live with integrity by understanding what God is saying in His Word. And by the Holy Spirit putting that into practice. Melakukannya dalam kehidupan kita. Last night we had a student meeting here. Kemarin malam kita ada pertemuan dengan mahasiswa. And we spoke about the importance of developing a Christian mind, a way of thinking. Kita berbicara tentang betapa pentingnya mengembangkan cara pikir Kristen. That Paul says we should have our minds should be renewed. Chapter twelve of Romans. Paulus mengatakan di Roma 12 bahwa pikiran kita harus dibahas di hari kesan. And through that transformation, we'll be able to live as God calls us to live. Melalui perubahan itu, kita akan bisa hidup seperti yang Tuhan inginkan. So at the heart of living consistently is the importance of understanding and obeying what God has said. Jadi inti dari hidup konsisten itu adalah mengerti dan melakukan apa yang Tuhan katakan dalam firman. And it must be a big challenge to Christians all around the world. Oh, tentu saja itu adalah tantangan yang sangat besar bagi semua orang Kristen di seluruh dunia. That it seems we are not studying and understanding the Bible as we should. Tampaknya kita tidak mengerti atau mempelajari Alkitab sebagaimana seharusnya. I said yesterday to the students, the danger is we keep the Bible in quarantine. Bahaya, bahaya ni adalah jika kita menaruh alkitab kita di satu tempat yang tersembunyi. We might read the Bible here at this conference and tomorrow in our church. Kita mungkin membaca alkitab di sini atau besok pagi di gereja. But we don't bring the challenges of the Bible to our everyday life. Tetapi kita tidak membawa tantangan-tantangan yang ada di dalam Alkitab ini dalam kehidupan kita. We don't bring the questions of life to the Bible. Kita tidak membawa pertanyaan-pertanyaan kita dalam kehidupan ini kepada kita. Often there is no two-way conversation. Sering kali tidak ada komunikasi dua arah. But for the Christian minds to be formed, the renewal of the minds. Tetapi supaya Pikiran Kristen kita dipahami. It means the truth will shape the way I contract my business. Kebenaran kita itu membentuk bagaimana kita membentuk bagaimana kita berbisnis. The truth will impact how I behave sexually. Kebenaran Alkitab akan membawa pengaruh atas bagaimana kita bersikap secara sesuai. The truth will affect how I react in my family. Kebenaran Alkitab juga berpengaruh terhadap bagaimana kita bersikap di keluarga kita. The truth will shape how I respond in a culture of corruption. Kebenaran Alkitab membentuk kita untuk bagaimana bersikap di tengah-tengah komunitas yang The truth sets us free. Kebenaran itu membebaskan kita. The truth sanctifies us, makes us what we should be. 
kebenaran itu memudahkan kita membuat kita melakukan apa yang seharusnya. So that's why we encourage one another to know and believe and obey the word of God. Itu sebabnya saya memotivasi setiap kita untuk mempelajari Alkitab dan melakukan. I think you found listen to me a great deal this morning. Thank you very much. Saya rasa Anda sudah mendengarkan saya. Terima kasih.